before us. And let us take our Bibles now and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. As we continue to wrap up our study of the book of Ecclesiastes, and Solomon, of course, is bringing to a conclusion the observations that he has made over the course of his life and being able to impart some final thoughts on wisdom. And that is where we are here this evening. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We're going to be reading in verse 8. And so if you're there and you could stand with me, please, as we begin to read Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and beginning in verse 8. The Bible says this, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed, and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. and That which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads. And his nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further, by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless the time that we have in the Word of God here this evening. We pray, Lord, that you would indeed impart to us wisdom and grace by your word. I pray, Father, that we would glean much from the scriptures tonight and, Father, throughout this week as we give good heed to the things that have been contained in your word for our benefit. And Father, we pray all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, as we come to uh, this almost end of the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, again, is beginning to wind down his observations. He kind of harkens back to his initial premise. If we recall, early in the book, one of the pet phrases that Solomon would continue to repeat is, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And uh, he comes back to that very thought. But now I believe he comes with a different a different tenor in his voice, so to speak. When he began Ecclesiastes with this, uh, there was a, a distinct depression, if you will, as he is looking back on a life that has been wasted. And he said, all the things that I have tried, all the things that I've spent my time, my, my wealth in, all of these things have turned into sand drifting through my fingers. I have really wasted so much of my life pursuing life without God. And certainly any life that removes God is vanity. It is emptiness. But now we come to the end of the book. And I think rather than giving a depressing thought, I think he is giving an ad admonition. It is at this point that when he says vanity of vanities, all is vanity, he is saying, listen, I have tried all of these things and I have learned from my mistakes. There are things here that I have imparted that you might not make those same mistakes. You might live your life with fewer regrets, fewer regrets than I have. However, always keep in mind, and here is the, is the takeaway point with this verse, I believe, always keep in mind that life is indeed a vapor. It is indeed a breath, and that really is the thought behind this phrase. While on the one side he is lamenting the emptiness of that life, at this point he is saying, pay attention because I have gone through life and I have squandered much of my life. You, on the other hand, as my son, and we're going to see that he is addressing this to his son, uh, to his heir, he's saying, listen, Life is brief. It is temporary. It is not going to be here forever. And as such, take heed to the wisdom that I am seeking to impart to you. Don't fall into the same trap. Don't fall into the same pit that I have fallen into. Be aware that time is precious. 
Don't squander it. Don't waste it. Make the most of the time that you do have because it is a vapor. We're reminded of James. James chapter 4 where the uh, Apostle James is admonishing the saints. He said, listen, uh, there is an error in your midst where you are assuming some things about your life. Uh, we're going to get up on a certain day and we're going to do this and that and the other thing. And while there's nothing wrong with planning out your day and going through uh, a process, an itinerary, a calendar, uh, he's saying there is a missing feature in your plans and that is the fact that one, your life cannot be guaranteed. Your life is a vapor. It is a breath. It is here for a while and then it is gone. It is far better too then to put all of this in God's hands and say if God will, I will accomplish this or that or the other thing. Is to introduce a very important feature and that is the presence of God in day-to-day -day life. And really that I think is what is the the missing ingredient in the early part of Ecclesiastes was taking God out of the picture, and as a result, what do I have left? I have nothing. I have emptiness. I have vanity. When I put God back into it, I still must remember that life is fleeting, so the time that I have needs to be spent in the pursuit of wisdom. And that, of course, leads very naturally into what Solomon says in the next verses. He says in verse 9, and moreover, because the preacher was wise. Now this might be uh, this might be debatable. One might say, well, wait a minute, how is he wise? How was he wise in living the way he lived? The beauty, the beauty, and for me this is important because the beauty is this book, and granted he did not have all of this book, but we can assume that the wisdom that he was given by God did not deviate from what we have right here. We have everything that Solomon would have had access to uh, by way of his wisdom. And the beauty of this wisdom is that regardless of whether I take advantage of it or not, whether I apply myself to it or not, it is still God's wisdom. It is still in my possession. I have access to it. I can learn from it. I can continue to benefit from it. It is my choice. But whether I do or not does not change fundamentally the truth that this book is God's wisdom. Uh, we do not want to blame God. When things don't go our way, say, well, I tried that or I tried this and it didn't work out for me. No, we did not because God's word always works. And so when the preacher says he was still wise, he is being honest. God gave him wisdom. He did not avail himself of that wisdom, but he still had that wisdom. And he was able then to reflect upon his mistakes and then filter it through the wisdom God had given him to make the principles and the proverbs that we benefit from today and his son would benefit from uh, in the future as well. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher, his folly notwithstanding, retained his capacity for wisdom. And in that capacity, he was able to test as we take a look again in verse 9, he says he gave good heed. Uh, that, that, that suggests testing, uh, weighing out, uh, uh, carefully processing uh, what he had experienced and what he had learned. You know, if you've ever just gone through a day, uh, particularly an eventful day, one that has been full of uh, maybe some craziness, and you just sit back and you reflect for a uh, a time you think about you know the decisions you made and the things that you said and and where you went and and just kind of uh, process this and weigh it out test and say okay what could I have done differently did I do everything the way God would have had me to do it and this is really what Solomon is referring to I, I've been able to uh, look back on my life and give good heed to examine what it is that I spent my life on to see how it benefited me or how it hurt me. And then through that process and through that examination, through that testing, set in order, outline, if you will, um, a, a syllabi of life experience. And of course, that's what Ecclesiastes is, a syllabi of life experiences. 
we can look at that and say, boy, okay, this is how you do not do certain things, and this is how you do do certain things. And he says this is what uh, God, by God's grace, of course, uh, he was able to process and uh, test, examine, outline in orderly fashion the principles that he had learned through those experiences. Uh, you know, we've heard the phrase, uh, those that do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And how many of us prove that on a regular basis? We, we make some of the same mistakes over and over and over and over again in life. We don't sit back and process way out, examine these things, learn from these things so that we don't make those same mistakes again. And as a result of this process, as a result of laying all this out, thinking these things through, he was able to provide lessons. He was able to teach the people knowledge, understanding, discernment. The whole focus of our study in Ecclesiastes has been about living life without regret, learning from mistakes of Solomon to develop discernment to develop understanding to develop the capacity to process what it is we're seeing here and even reflect upon our own life experiences many of us I think can identify with the mistakes that Solomon made and say you know what I know what he's talking about I see exactly where he's coming from and I don't want to go there again I don't want to make those same mistakes again so the preacher his folly notwithstanding was able to retain that capacity for wisdom and convert it into positive instruction. In verse 10, he says the preacher sought to find out acceptable words, uh, pleasant words, delightful words. In other words, there was a passion in what he was seeking to accomplish here. Uh, he was excited about how he could take these experiences and passionately share them with his son he says to um, find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright even words of truth uh, solomon approached this task if you will and again we're going to see that it was directed chiefly to his son he said listen and it could have been rehoboam for all we know saying look son um your father has made some serious mistakes but i have learned from those mistakes and i don't want you to make some of those mistakes and so i am doing my best to convey to you in a very concise a very passionate way uh an exciting way if you will uh how you can avoid those mistakes and he says along with this i want to give you a guarantee let's take again a look at verse 10 where he says that which was written was upright very straightforward words of truth uh, Solomon, because of his experiences and because it was coupled with the wisdom that God had given to him, was able to convey with very straightforward certainty that what I'm giving you is going to work, that this is the way you want to go. And he says, I want to couch this in, in terms that will entice you to follow uh, my counsel, to follow not in my steps of the path, those were mistakes, but rather to learn from those and take steps that are honoring to the God and will ultimately bless your life. And so he says, this is what I have dedicated myself to. Um, it, it, is, it is to his credit that Solomon, after having made such a hash of so much of his life, and again, you know, here is the wisest man who ever lived not benefiting from that wisdom later in life to the point where that, that nation was split because of him. Ten, ten tribes were stripped from the lineage of David. And it was because of Solomon. It was Solomon's fault that that happened. It was his sins that created that. But as to his credit, as he looks at this, and no doubt Solomon knew this was going to happen, Solomon was aware of what was going to befall his son. But to his credit, he says, listen, son, I want you to pay attention to this. I don't want you to make some of these same mistakes. I want to give you something that will help you uh, and give you the assurance. This is truth. This is straightforward. This is straight from the heart. I am leveling with you. I'm shooting from the hip. This is, uh, there's no equivocation. There is no fudging. There is no gray area. 
what I'm sharing with you is sound advice. It is counsel. And if I can just, there's no way I can overemphasize this. We, we have God's Word. This is His book. This is His mind revealed to us. And yet, how often do we read this with almost a jaundiced perspective? We just kind of breeze through it without recognizing the treasury that is in our lap, what is right here for our benefit. And Solomon is saying the same thing. Son, I, what I'm giving you, is very, very precious, very, very valuable. I cannot state it in any stronger language. He says, I'm trying to give you something very delightful, something that is very uh, appealing, something that is very positive, and something that has tremendous assurance. That's what I want to give you to pay attention. And, you know, as Christians, we have the composite Word of God. Everything that we need is right here in this book right here. And if there is some way, by God's grace, we can stir our hearts to view it in the light in which it was given, that it is God's revelation. And he says, listen, the people, the the saints that take God seriously and the saints that listen and heed the word of God are the ones that are going to get ahead in the end. And this really is what I believe Solomon is trying to convey uh, to his son to uh, give him this wisdom in a very positive, straightforward, certain, certain spirit. We come to verses 11 and 12. And he begins to frame the value of this wisdom, the importance of this wisdom. He says in verse 11, the words of the wise, and I think we can assume that he is referring to his words because he says, moreover, the preacher had his wisdom and he wrote these things down. He has conveyed these things. So he says the words of the wise and it probably is not speaking exclusively of him, but of all of the law and the prophets. But the words of the wise are as, first of all, goads. Goads. What is a goad? A goad, uh, those that deal or have familiarity with with farm animals that understand that a goad is generally a pointed stick. And what do you do with that pointed stick? You goad the livestock. It might be cattle, it might be mules, whatever it might be. You goad them to get them to do what you want them to do. You're trying to uh, push them into the corral, you're trying to push them into the stall, and so you goad them you poke them, uh, it causes a bit of pain, but that's what then exacts from them the activity that you desire. You are goading them. And he says, listen, the words of the wise act as that goad to prick the conscience of those that read it. God has given us His Word, and the Holy Spirit acts as that goad that takes the Word of God and pricks our conscience and reminds us of our responsibility, but not only is it act, does it act as a goad to prick our conscience, it also acts as a goad to prod our will, to change, to act upon the conscience, to press us into a particular direction. I'm saying, son, I, I'm giving this to you to prick your conscience. I want you to think about these things, but I don't want you just to think about them. I don't want you to to just dwell upon them intellectually or even emotionally and spiritually. I want you to act on them physically. I want you to carry it out. I want you to have this actually press you, prod you, move you in a particular way to, to make decisions and choices that will help you in the end. He says the word wiser as goads that's what they are designed to accomplish and the word of god is that's what it does today when we read the word of god it is designed to bring about change because god knows that we are not what we need to be from the start he knows we've got a lot of changes to make 
we're new creatures in Christ Jesus. All of the old needs to be done away with, and the process requires a little goading, <laughs> a little poking, a little pricking of the conscience, saying this is what needs to happen. Paul told Timothy to reprove, rebuke, exhort to the preaching of the Word of God. Paul says that the end times even the saints will not put up with sound doctrine. Why? Because they're not interested in being goaded. Want to be pressed in a direction. They want to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They want to be tickled. They want to be uh, uh, petted. They want to be um, you know, made to feel good all the time. That is human nature, by the way. <clears throat> but the purpose of the Word of God is primarily as a goad. Because God knows that we are not what we should be and knows that we need to be something else, to be fashioned in the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And as a result, He has provided the Word of God to goad us, if you will, to prick us, to prod us in the direction that we need to go. That is why at Mount View we try to focus upon the preaching and teaching of the Word of God even if it may step on some toes, even if it may be a little uncomfortable, even if it may not be politically correct. I mean, we have a, a culture of copycat churches today. Everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon of having some new program, some new sensation, some new uh, fascinating thing to, to uh, excite and to scintillate and to make the service you know, different. And while there's nothing wrong in and of itself with things that are new and exciting and fresh, let's never lose sight of the fact that there is someone we're supposed to be following and it is not the leader as far as churches are concerned. Anybody wants to say, hey, um, I, I want to follow and pattern my church after that church over there or my ministry after that person over there. The one leader that everyone needs to be focused upon is Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. And it needs to please him. It needs to be something that he is pleased with. And sometimes that means preaching and teaching that is not always comfortable is not always something that we want to hear, and yet it is something we need to hear. And so Solomon says, the words of the wise are as goads, and then he goes on in his illustration and says, and they're also as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies. He's talking about uh, these nails or these pegs. He's, he's not, you know, my first thought was that we're dealing with, uh, with uh, a carpentry, we're building something, but really that is not the sense in which this, uh, this verse is to be understood. He's talking about that which is a peg, that which is something that is fastened upon which you can hang things that you can cling to and hold on to, and he say that the masters of assemblies are those that are collecting, if you will, these proverbs and these principles and putting them in a repository for us to hang on to and to hang our life upon. That's the picture that is being described because he then says, as from one shepherd. In other words, God himself is revealing his truth to his servants. The Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They were the collectors. They were the masters of assemblies. They were the ones that were given the blessing of God's word, and they would collect that. They would hear it. They would write it down, and they would then uh, put it someplace where people then could grab a hold of it and be strengthened in their faith. That is the picture that is being given here uh, that the guard of the Word of God, the guard of these principles are fixed unalterably for us. They are fastened as a peg, as a nail, something that does not move. Something that is fixed. Something that you can count on. Something that you can depend on. This book is a peg upon which your life can be held. It is a fixed point. And it is something that has been collected 
beneficently for us by God's servants. They were fastened there by the masters of assemblies. And these masters of assemblies are working under the auspices and the authority of the one shepherd. There is one shepherd, and he has invested his wisdom in the masters of assemblies, those responsible for collecting God's wisdom of whom Solomon is one. Solomon is one. But there was David, there was Moses, there was Joshua. Then we go to the New Testament, of course, and we're also talking about John and Peter and Paul. These are the masters of assemblies that are operating under the auspices and authority of the Good Shepherd. He says, I want you to give this wisdom. I want you to write it down because this wisdom is going to provide that nail that is going to be a, a sure and fixed point in their life upon which they can hang and cling for their benefit and for their life. And of course, they are then enlightened. They are enlightened by the Spirit of God. He says in verse 12, and further by these, my son, be admonished be enlightened be illuminated have your heart your mind opened to what you find here to what can be a blessing to you this is what he's saying these things are there to goad you and to guard you to guide you into the truth that the one shepherd, the good shepherd, the one who has your best interest at heart, has invested in these who have collected these principles and are now giving them to you under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that you might benefit thereby. And he says, by these things, by these things, my son, be admonished, be enlightened. And then he says, in the latter part of that same verse, and it sounds almost contradictory. But understand the spirit in which this passage is being given. He says, further by these my son be admonished. But then he says, of making many books there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. You might think, well, now wait a minute. You just said we sure to be admonished by what is written. And now you're saying that you can go overboard. No, that's not really what he's saying here. He is he is really distinguishing between what he has imparted by way of God's wisdom from what you can get elsewhere. That's what he's talking about. Matter of fact, maybe what might help is if we compare a little bit of Scripture with Scripture in the very same book. Let's take a look at chapter 7, verse 25. This, of course is Solomon at that transition point in his life experiences. And he says in verse 25 of Ecclesiastes 7, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. Chapter 8 and verse 9. He says this, all this have I seen and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. There's a time wherein one man ruleth over another to his own hurt. Down verse 16, same chapter. He says, when I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the busyness, the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. And I beheld all the work of God. Uh, in these verses, Solomon was reflecting upon his own pursuit of knowledge and of wisdom, some of which would have been what God had given, but some of it was also just his observation of life and just being able to assess what he is seeing and assimilate this information, things that he would have read and seen in life. And so it's at this point here in chapter 12 where Solomon says you really have only so much time to dedicate your life to genuine wisdom. And you have a choice. You can focus your wisdom upon what God has provided as the shepherd through his master assemblers, those that have collected these things and imparted these things under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Or you can follow in my steps and say, hey, I'm going to learn this on my own. I'm going to just kind of see what I can come up with myself. And I'm going to read this. And 
There are a lot of people out there that say, I read all sorts of books and philosophy and religion and all these other things, and all they ultimately do is confuse themselves. Now, I'm not saying it is not good to study. I'm not saying it is not good to read. Not saying it's not good to expand our mind and our thinking. But understand that if we have to make any, any allowances, we must always make sure that the one thing that we grab a hold of first is the Bible. This is where the wisdom lies. And he says you, you can chase after all sorts of butterflies out there, but this is where you're going to find what you really need to have. This is really, I think, what he's telling his son in verse 12 here. He's saying you, you can wear yourself out trying to learn all that I try to learn. And he says, I came to the conclusion, vanity of vanities, all of vanity. He says, I, nobody could do more than I have done. And he said, son, you don't need to go there. You really don't. All you really need is the wisdom that is contained right here. This is it right here. To be able to say, this is what I want. This is what I need. And when we are learning other things that are out there, filtering even that through the prism of God's Word. And when we find something that does not align itself with the wisdom of God's Word, we discard it. It's unworthy of us. This is our base. This is the foundation for our life. I think that's really what Solomon is trying to point out to his son. He says, I've been there. I've done that. I've tried all of these things. You don't need to do the same thing. You will wear yourself out. What you do need to do is grab a hold of the things that have been given with certainty that will benefit you because ultimately they have come. And I like how he put it here in verse 11. He says, which are given from one shepherd. He speaks of the plural, the masters of assemblies, but really it all comes from the one shepherd. It comes from God. God gives us His Word, and that is really all we need to know. They may have been written by other human authors, but all of them wrote what God Himself instructed them to write. This is the book that we need above all else. This is the learning, the education we need. We grab a hold of it. We cling to it. We thrive on it. We live by it. And we shall be blessed. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless as we close our service tonight. Grateful for being in the house of the Lord and studying the Word of God together. Pray that you would use this to further encourage us to cling faithfully to your Word and the wisdom that we find in its pages. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.